Hi class, it's Dr. Lindner. Um, in this video, we're gonna be talking a little bit about blood and give you a little bit more of a uh, confident, stronger foundation on blood and different types of blood cells and red blood cells and white blood cells. And um, so let's start with some of the basic physical properties of blood. Um, there is a difference in um, the amount of blood that's found in a male and female males. At any given time, there's about five to six liters of blood in circulation and females about four to five liters of blood. Temperature of blood ranges between 100 degrees Fahrenheit to 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the pH of blood has a very, very tight range of 7.35 to 7.45 with the average of 7.4, which means that if we look at the pH scale of zero to 14, and we know that right in the, seven, in the center is seven, which is neutral, anything from zero to 6.99999, that's gonna be an acid, and anything above 7.0, up to 14 is a base or an alkaline. So if we're looking at 7.4, somewhere around here, we're saying that blood is slightly alkalinic. Uh, just to give you an idea, let's say somewhere around here, 2.3, that's the pH of the stomach due to all of the stomach digestive enzymes and acids, just to give you a little bit of an idea. So we want blood pH to be 7.4. Every um, body part has a different pH. So don't believe the hype or these trends or these fads when people say, I'm drinking alkaline water. I want to alkalinize my entire body because cancer cells do not thrive in an alkaline environment. It's impossible to change the pH of all body tissues. Women know this better than men because women know they have a vaginal pH and it needs to be a specific pH. And if the pH changes too much, then women can get like a bacterial vaginosis. So every body tissue has a different pH. So blood pH should be around 7.4. Now, most of us have had blood taken at one point in time in our lives. Um, should be done on a yearly basis just to be proactive. Um, many people have to do it more frequently to check certain biomarkers, and that's fine based on the doctors wanting to get these objective um, measurements on their patients where they get a baseline and then they monitor them maybe a few times a year, whether they're checking blood sugar or vitamin status or inflammatory biomarkers or thyroid levels, et cetera. So during phlebotomy, when a blood is drawn, they'll spin it through a centrifuge. And when it spins, you get the separation of elements where we have the heavier stuff sinks to the bottom, right? Those are the formed elements. And then the lighter stuff floats to the top, which is the plasma. Now, if you think back to anatomy and physiology one, uh, we did a lecture on different types of tissue. There was epithelial tissue, connective tissue, there was uh, muscle tissue and nerve tissue. And what differentiated epithelial tissue from connective tissue is that in epithelial tissue, it's a bunch of cells closely packed together with very little extracellular matrix, whereas connective tissue, the cells were scattered further apart with lots of extracellular matrix and some protein fibers. So here we have plasma, which is the extracellular matrix that makes up 55% of blood. And then 45% are going to be the formed elements like the red blood cells and white blood cells, okay? So if we look at the plasma, which is the extracellular matrix, the 55% of blood, it's made up of water 
and plasma proteins and salts um, like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, these also act as electrolytes. So plasma acts as the ECM, the extracellular matrix of blood. It is a clear straw colored fluid in which all the components of the blood are suspended. If we talk about serum, serum is the plasma minus the clotting elements that's found in blood. When we talk about the formed elements, which make up 45% of blood, then the formed elements are the red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets. So the RBCs are known as erythrocytes. The WBCs, the white blood cells, are leukocytes. And platelets are called thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are involved in helping uh, blood vessels clot. If someone gets a cut or they get stabbed or shot or something and they're losing blood, then thrombocytes or platelets go into play and they help us clot. Um, with clotting, calcium is really important for clotting as well as uh, vitamin K. Vitamin K is really important for helping us clot. So um, this is a really nice uh, diagram to look at. So if we look at the left-hand side, we'll see that we have uh, whole blood, which makes up about 8% if you look at body weight, whereas other fluids and tissues make up 92%. Now, if we take blood and we divvy that up, we divide it up again, we see that blood plasma makes up 55% and the formed elements, the cells that we see down here, red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets, that makes up 45%. So let's look at the plasma. Let's look at the 55%. It's made up of water, huge percentage water, right? So drink water. It's really important to have. Um, how much water should one be drinking? General rule of thumb is you take your body weight, you cut that number in half, and you drink that amount in ounces. That is a safe amount to drink for the most part as a general rule. So if a person weighs uh, 150 pounds, 75 ounces of water. You weigh 200 pounds, 100 ounces of water. Uh, especially in the winter time, more people dehydrate in the winter than they do in the summer because in the summer months, the warmer months, uh, people are more cognizant and more aware that, hey, you know, I'm sweating, I'm exercising, I don't want to dehydrate, I'm playing more sports outside, let me um, hydrate myself. In the winter time, people forget about it. They're drinking more coffee, more teas. Keep in mind they're diuretic, so you can lose water. So make sure you drink your water. So 91.5% of the plasma is water. 7% are proteins. What type of proteins? We're looking at albumin, globular proteins, fibrinogen. We'll talk about what some of their functions are in just a second. Then we have other solutes that make up one and a half percent. These are electrolytes and nutrients and gases, some regulatory substances, and even waste products. Okay, so plasma 55 percent, proteins make up seven percent, water 91 and a half, solutes one and a half percent. If we look at the formed elements, here's where we have our red blood cells our white blood cells and our platelets. And let's review what they are called. So our red blood cells are erythrocytes. Our white blood cells are leuco, leuco means white, leukocytes. And platelets are sometimes referred to as thrombocytes because they're involved in creating a thrombus or a clot. Now, the RBCs or the red blood cells, their primary function, if we look at them, there are these biconcave discs. They're thicker in the periphery, thinner on the inside. Their primary function is to carry hemoglobin, heme and globin. Well, here's globin, 
on top. It's a globular protein binding to heme, which is iron. And to that iron, we're going to have gases that attach to it, whether it's oxygen, carbon dioxide, or even nitric oxide. When we look at white blood cells, white blood cells are neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Now, I like to refer to Ben, basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils. Ben, these are called granular sites. And then we have lymphocytes and monocytes. These are agranular, meaning the cytoplasm does not have granules, whereas in the basophil, the eosinophil, and the neutrophil, there are granulations in the cytoplasm that will degranulate to help rid the body of pathogens, okay? Uh, the agranular sites are lymphocytes and monocytes, no granules in the cytoplasm. Platelets are the thrombocytes that are involved with clotting. Okay, so let's look at the um, proteins. So albumin, that we mentioned before, here's globulin. So albumin is gonna regulate osmotic pressure of blood and therefore it moderates osmotic pressure of body fluids. So albumin is the major component of osmotic pressure in plasma. Uh, globulins, these participate in the immune system. So they are called immunoglobulins. When you study immunology, you will learn of immunoglobulin IgAs, or uh, let me go back, IgAs, there are IgMs, there are IgEs, there are IgGs, just to give you an idea, immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin M, immunoglobulin E, and immunoglobulin G, just to give you a few examples of them. Some, some antibodies show up immediately. Some antibodies take a little bit longer time to respond. Some have a delayed reaction. So globulins are involved in antibody production or immunoglobulins, and they transport uh, proteins, that's what globulins do. So you have hemoglobin, right? Globin is a globular protein and it's a transport protein that transports iron. Uh, fibrinogens, fibrinogen, anything that ends in ogen is inactive. So fibrinogen has to be activated into fibrin and fibrin is then involved in helping us clot. Okay, so those are some of the main types of proteins that are important. Um, here's just a um, example of a blood slide on the bottom right where we're looking at the majority of these cells are red blood cells. And then we have these irregular fragmented parts called platelets for clotting. The matrix is called blood plasma, right? That's everything between the cells. And then we have these white blood cells. This one here happens to be a neutrophil. Uh, this one down here on the bottom happens to be a monocyte. We'll talk about how we can look at them and determine whether it's a basophil or an eosinophil or neutrophil. We'll talk about some of their characteristics. Um, so let's take a look at a red blood cell, when we look at it, it's like seven and a half to eight micrometers. Uh, when we look at it from a side view, we can see it's this biconcave disc, right? Where it's thicker on the inside, uh, thicker on the outside and the periphery, if we outline it, and thinner in the inside. So the inside portion, like the inner part of this donut, uh, we say it looks a little bit lighter, so you'll hear the term hypochromic. Hypo means less, chrome, chromatic color. So it's less color, it's lighter in the center and darker around the periphery. These measurements are important because it helps us understand how 
red blood cells recycle themselves or how their lifespan after about 100 to 120 days, how they're involved in bursting and recycling. Um, part of which, uh, I might as well mention it now since we're on the picture, if you look at the diameter of a red blood cell, when it's youthful and young, it's quite flexible, just like people. We have good flexibility the younger we are, but the older an individual gets, sometimes you become a little bit more rigid and stiff and lose the flexibility. Now imagine this blood vessel, this um, blood cell is trying to fit through a blood vessel that is half the size in diameter. Well, it can try and squeeze its way in, but eventually it's not that flexible. It just pops and bursts and all the different components, some of it can be recycled and some of it, the body's going to get rid of. Okay, I just want to lay down a little bit of that now. So when we get to it, uh, you won't be hearing it for the first time. Red blood cells are anucleated. Whenever we put A in front of something, it means without, so it's without nucleus. Mature erythrocytes do not contain any nuclear material. Um, the space formerly taken up by the nucleus can now be used to store hemoglobin. So in its evolution, right, it starts as a proerythroblast or a normal blast. It has a nucleus, but then it ejects it, becomes a reticulocyte, and uh, red blood cells no longer have a nucleus. Now, if it had a nucleus, the nucleus is one of the largest organelles. If it had a nucleus, there wouldn't be room for the hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is so essential because the heme portion is where oxygen is going to bind. Okay, so we need hemoglobin. Without oxygen, can't produce energy because it's gonna drive that oxygen into the mitochondria of the cell for ATP production. It is a biconcave disc. Um, because it's biconcave, there's increased surface area and the RBC is the place for, uh, for gas exchange to take place. And the fact that it is biconcave in its early childhood infancy stage, it's very flexible. It can get in and out of a lot of tissues. It's anaerobic. Erythrocytes employ anaerobic cellular respiration in order to satisfy their energy needs. So it's not gonna utilize any of the oxygen that it's trying to transport and deliver to other parts of the body. The uh, circulating anucleated biconcave disc-shaped cells. Now, it's kind of like a misnomer, it really shouldn't be called a cell. It should be called a red blood corpuscle because cells contain a nucleus, but red blood cells lack a nucleus. There's about 5 million uh, red blood cells per cubic millimeter, and it can increase to 8 million with exercise. There are about 7.5 to 8 microns in size, a little bit larger in males due to hormones like testosterone that'll make them a little bit uh, larger. And the body can make 2 million new red blood cells per minute. One of the hormones involved in increasing red blood cell production is produced by the kidneys, and it is referred to as EPO, which stands for erythropoietin, erythropoietin. Red blood cells live about 120 days. They're destroyed by the spleen and the liver. Uh, in the bone marrow, there is a normoblast that has a nucleus. Remember I said red blood cells start out with a nucleus and then it loses it when it moves out into circulation. It's called a reticulocyte. And reticulocytes are found in circulation for just about 24 hours at best. The functions of red blood cells, they're going to transport uh, oxygen, they'll transport carbon dioxide, they'll transport nutrients, hormones, they disperse heat, and they're involved in the elimination of waste products. Red blood cells are also regulating the homeostasis of fluids in the body, pH, 
body temperature, and even water content. And blood protects us against excessive loss of blood by clotting. And it uses the WBCs, the white blood cells, to help protect, protect us against any type of infections. Red blood cells live for about 120 days or so, whereas lymphocytes are able to live for years, while some other cells live for just a few days or even a few weeks. But lymphocytes can live for, for years. The number of red blood cells and platelets remain pretty much steady while that of white blood cells can vary depending on the invading pathogens and, and other foreign antigens that these uh, white blood cells are going to attack. The process of blood cell production is called hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis is the production of blood cells. When it's red blood cell production is called erythropoiesis, erythropoiesis which is why we have erythropoietin, which is what the kidneys release, goes to the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. So here is the body starting with this pluripotent stem cell. And from this pluripotent stem cell, it can divide into a myeloid cell or a lymphoid cell. Now it's dividing into a lymphoid cell the lymphoid cell can mature into a T lymphocyte or B lymphocyte, right? So the T lymph, I'm sorry, a T lymphoblast, which becomes a T lymphocyte or a B lymphoblast, which can evolve into a B lymphocyte, what we call B cells and T cells. The B cell will evolve into plasma cells and these plasma cells are going to evolve and create antibodies, IgGs, IgEs, right? Immunoglobulin A's, immunoglobulin M's, immunoglobulin G's. Um, the NK lymphoblast becomes an NK cell or a natural killer cell. So that's the lymphoid stem cell. Creates T cells, B cells, and NK cells. The B cells become plasma cells. Plasma cells produce antibodies. Now on the myeloid stem cell side, from the myeloid stem cell, that's going to create your red blood cells, your platelets, and these white blood cells, basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils, those are granular sites. And the myeloid stem cell produces one agranular site. From a monoblast, it creates a monocyte. Now, monocytes are always in blood circulation. When the monocyte finds a pathogen or some sort of lesion or a foreign antigen or protein of some sort, monocytes will dive into that tissue and once it's in the tissue, a monocyte is now known as a macrophage, a macrophage, cell eating, okay? From a myeloid stem cell, we also can create mast cells and mast cells are really important because they're found in the skin, they're found in the respiratory tract and they're found in the gut and mast cells produce histamine. Now, if you think about that, right? Mast cells produce histamine and you eat a food that you're allergic to and the gut recognizes that, the gut releases histamine, but at the same point in time, your ears can get itchy, your scalp can get itchy, your tush can get itchy because mast cells are found in the skin. You can get red and irritated and then you can get nasally because mast cells are in the respiratory tract. And then the histamine reaction clogs up your nose, right? It gets swollen. So mast cells are really involved in histamine release. And uh, here's a little bit of interesting information that you can modulate the amount of histamine uh, release and modulate that with vitamin C, 
Vitamin C is really important in regulating mast cells from pushing out too much histamine. Okay, so, uh, so from the myeloid cell, we can make these, look at the normal blast or the pro-erythroblast, and it becomes a reticulocyte. You see, it, it ejects its nucleus and becomes a reticulocyte. And after about 24 hours or so, the reticulocyte becomes an erythrocyte, no nucleus. From a megakaryoblast, it becomes a megakaryocyte. Think of it as a big glass sheet, right, with a nucleus. And then you drop the glass and it fragments into so many different um, sections, right? The glass just shatters. So each of those broken pieces, pieces of glass are now called platelets, okay? And how can we uh, downregulate platelet function? How do we minimize clotting? Blood thinners. Um, most people use aspirin for blood thinning. There's uh, warfarin or heparin. These are uh, medically uh, pharmaceutical uh, blood thinners. But there's a lot of natural things that people use to thin the blood, um, fish oils, omega-3s, uh, resveratrol from red wine, garlic can thin the blood, niacin can thin the blood. There's a lot of uh, natocerazines can thin the blood, lots of things. Um, some interesting information about warfarin. Warfarin was rat poison. It's still used as rat poison. And it was, they'd feed it to rats to kill them. Um, and they realized the mechanism of killing rats through warfarin was that it was a blood, it would thin the blood and the blood vessels would rupture. So they said, hey, what if we use this for humans, but we dose it by weight, not to kill humans, but just to thin the blood. And that's where um, Coumadin had come from. All right, and again, I'll go through these in a little bit more detail so that you can identify how we differentiate an eosinophil from a basophil, from a neutrophil, from a monocyte, and from a lymphocyte. So the red blood cells, these erythrocytes contain uh, the protein hemoglobin, and that's used to carry oxygen to all the cells and to carry carbon dioxide uh, so that we can exhale that to the uh, environment. And each, each hemoglobin molecule contains an iron ion, which allows each molecule to bind to the four oxygen molecules. Remember the red blood cell has no nucleus. It's a biconcave disc and allows them to carry oxygen more efficiently. So um, when we look at a red blood cell, when we talk about hemoglobin, specifically, you know what, I'm going to pause here. When I come back, I'm going to focus on hemoglobin just by itself, okay, and probably get into different types of anemia. So let's pause this video here. <laughs> 